What movie could you turn around and say that the good guy was really a complete butthole in? Tom and Jerry Tom is just a poor house cat trying to fight off the food-stealing, property-destroying, and teasing little vermin that is Jerry. I love rent, but seriously, it's about a bunch of teenagers who refuse to pay their rent because their friend and landlord Benny told them a while ago that they could live there rent-free, and now he's asking for them to contribute a bit. So they screw with Benny's business dealings and kill his dog. And then he… pays for Mimi to go to rehab? He's definitely the good guy in the movie if anyone is. Benny buys a building, lets his friends live in it for free, comes up with a business plan that would allow them to build a studio that would let them work on their craft. They would still be living rent-free by building condos over the studio and using the rent from the condos to help keep the studio open. The only thing I can see wrong with him is that he's a sucker who keeps allowing people around him to take advantage of his generosity. Mark is a failed screenwriter who villainizes the people he should be grateful to. He ignores his own parents on Christmas because they irritate him, despite them obviously caring a lot for him and missing him. And then he launches an attack on the one person who's trying to help him succeed by supporting him. Roger is a former smack addict, who fancies himself a tortured artist, but all he does is sit on his butt in the apartment feeling sorry for himself. Mimi is a 19-year-old smack-addicted exotic dancer who pushes substances on others and has a YOLO philosophy on life. Tom Collins is a bright, intelligent young man who could have had a great future ahead of him if he hadn't vandalized expensive electrical equipment at MIT and got himself fired. So his solution is to mooch off an old acquaintance and drink stoli while rewiring ATMs. Maureen is a narcissistic, untalented performing arts artist with no morals or sense of loyalty. She's unfaithful, manipulative, and only cares about herself. Angel is a street drummer who appears sweet and kind to all those around him, and yet has no qualms about killing an Akita he had no beef with, or breaking and entering. Joanne falls into the category of sucker. She's an uptight Ivy League graduate who finds herself in over her head when she meets someone who tries to teach her to let her hair down. The music in Rent is brilliant. The storyline is awful. I know some big musical fans who I feel like I can never bring up this new dark knowledge that I now possess to. I guess I'll just carry it with me to my grave. Such is the life. It's yours and my burden to bear, listeners. Peter Pan, as it is clearly said that Peter cut off Hook's hand for no reason. And the Lost Boys? Wendy and her brothers? They're just little kids who were taken from their rooms in the middle of the night to go live with a strange little boy in the middle of nowhere. And in the books, Peter kills the boys once they enter puberty. I think it makes a point to say that he's the only one with a weapon, his knife. The boys who escape him become the pirates and they're devoted to killing Peter Pan so he doesn't kill any more boys. I also think they're trapped on the island. Not sure about that, though. I read the novel when I was eight. Aladdin. He lies the entire time to get Jasmine, and it works. Serendipity. Both the lead male and female were narcissistic buttholes who crapped all over their devoted significant others. The Leprechaun Movies. The guy would happily mind his own business if people would just stay the heck off his gold. Squidward minds his own business. He just wants to paint his art and play the clarinet. In fact, you can type Squidward into Google Images, and you basically just get a load of facial expressions of someone being persecuted by his neighbors. He is a bit pretentious, though. The girl in the notebook. She cheated on her fiancé and then left him. Animal House is a movie about a college dean simply trying to retain order and safety amongst the Greek system and the fraternity responds by doing the deed with the dean's wife and Maya's underage daughter. A fraternity member poses as the boyfriend of a deceased sorority member to get a date, and the fraternity eventually destroys the town's parade. Jaws. They're hunting a shark because they're mad that it kills people in the ocean. Heavyweights. A bunch of morbidly obese children imprison the camp's owner for encouraging them to better themselves. Dead Snow. The zombies just wanted their stuff back from those D-bag medical students. Fred from Scooby-Doo. There are a variety of reasons why he's always the biggest villain in the series and movies, but probably the most pertinent is his exploitation of Shaggy and Scooby. Shaggy and Scooby are petrified of ghosts, but are always the pair that take the most risks in being human bait in one of Fred or Velma's master plans. Why? Scooby Snacks. 
Fred realizes the two are addicted to Scooby Snacks. Heck, Fred himself probably spikes them with white snow or something, so he abuses his monopoly over them to exploit Shaggy and Scooby's addiction. So addicted are the pair that they forgo all of their fears of ghosts just to get a hit. So when Fred says, Hey guys, why don't you volunteer? He already knows the answer will be a zombified yes if he promises Scooby Snacks or intoxicates the pair on Scooby Snacks beforehand. It's similar to promising smack to an addict, provided they do something they're usually scared of. Does the addict really have a choice? No. Fred got Scooby and Shaggy addicted to substances so they'd be more prone to taking risks. The Wizard of Oz I'm not suggesting Dorothy was evil, but she killed a woman and just accepted that what she'd done was okay because a bunch of little people she'd never met told her the woman was wicked. Seriously, if someone dropped a house on my sister and then proceeded to take her clothing, put the clothing on and then prance off down the road while singing, I'd send winged monkeys after them too. One that's really annoyed me since I've seen it, Happy Feet. The moral of the entire story is, if nature wants to save itself from mankind, it needs to learn how to entertain us better. Seriously, nature isn't entertaining enough for mankind to care, is what Happy Feet's writers seem to say. The Little Mermaid Seriously, it's a spoiled 16-year-old mermaid who throws a huge fit and becomes obsessed with a complete stranger. Then she makes a deal with the sea witch so that she can have legs and run off to marry the complete stranger. Okay, maybe this doesn't necessarily make her a bad person, but what the frick kind of lifestyle is Disney trying to portray as a good way to live? I read an incredibly detailed essay about Michael Bay's Transformers films on the Something Awful forums, if I recall correctly, that said, among other things, Optimus Prime was the series' main villain and Megatron was, if not the hero, then far more traditionally heroic. From what I remember, if you compare Optimus's narration throughout the three movies and what is revealed of the war on Cybertron through dialogue, it becomes very clear that Optimus is an unreliable narrator and the Autobots were an outsider group who, having conclusively lost the war, were willing to end their own species. Destroying the Allspark would cut off all possibility of continuing the species after all, as well as revenge killings. All of the Decepticons they and the military hunted down in the second movie who weren't shown as being aggressive. Megatron's character arc has him, after winning the first war, traveling to Earth to retrieve the Allspark so his race can continue, then getting frozen by pure chance, getting discovered, studied, and having his body violated to make our technology, finally escaping with the help of a few loyal friends only to discover that his old enemies are in league with the creatures who've been dissecting him for the last century. Having one of the creatures, a particularly annoying one, use the object he's been striving for to kill him, and then after getting resurrected, trying to keep his people together while being usurped twice, and all the while being hunted by Optimus and those monstrous, bloodthirsty humans. Not that this wasn't a particularly fun perspective and all, but I'm pretty sure that the guy who wrote the theory put more thought into Michael Bay's Transformers than Michael Bay ever did. And I'm not even a Michael Bay hater, I love me a good pew-pew CGI robots movie. But yeah, there was no way he was thinking on this level. Let's not beat around the bush. In Toy Story 1, Woody is a massive, selfish jerk who's jealous of Buzz and tries to kill him. He doesn't try to kill him, his intention was to knock him behind the desk so that Woody would be taken to Pizza Planet instead. The plan went awry when Buzz dodged. The Dentist on Finding Nemo They make him out to be some kind of kidnapper, but he was just trying to find a nice present for his special needs niece. Mate, you can't just call Australian kids special need kids. Mrs. Doubtfire Robin Williams is a creepy dad stalking his old family. The Harry Potter series Dumbledore He's manipulative and out for the greater good, even if it means setting a child up to face death. Even if Harry didn't die, he thought he would. Not to mention his association with Grindelwald, and the fact that he knew so much information and could have saved a lot of time if he'd just told Harry to begin with. But of course, J.K. Rowling did a brilliant job with the series, and I know that if Dumbledore did say anything, the books and movies would not have been as epic as they were. And I know full well that this isn't a popular opinion. I know that he had to be that way to protect the wizarding world. I just answered the question when I noticed that no one else had mentioned Dumbledore yet. I have read Methods of Rationality. Beauty and the Beast A man tries to save his love from a crazy beast who almost killed her father and practically enslaved her. 
I mean, this take would work if Gaston wasn't such an insufferable jerk. Hamlet. He murders his uncle based on the testimony of a freaking ghost. Come on, son. That's the point of his wishy-washiness the whole play. The real evidence, while mostly circumstantial, but enough for Hamlet, was his uncle flinching and leaving during the play within a play. Law-abiding citizen. Starship Troopers. It's all government propaganda to make themselves seem superior. The bugs didn't launch a meteor, they just became a media scapegoat for the meteor strike on Buenos Aires. You can submit your own stories to be featured here on the channel. The story submission link is in the description below. And if you want to listen to some vibey music in the background, check out Easy Mode, also linked below, and subscribe. Pirates of the Caribbean. Jack was a pirate, but they made the English the bad guys for persecuting him. I know that's the point of the story, but it still bothered me as a child. I think the reason Jack is considered heroic is because they never necessarily showed him doing piratey things throughout all four movies. We never see him steal from or kill the innocents, as pirates were prone to doing. We just see a mischievous guy who goes on grand adventures and treasure hunts. Also, I would say that the English are evil in the same way Hank from Breaking Bad is evil. Which is to say they aren't, they're just lawful. And since the heroes go up against the law, that puts them at odds. Avatar. The humans were industrious and ambitious, and the aliens were lazy. Assuming Jared Diamond is correct, the Na'vi have everything going for them. Superior crops, massive horses and freaking birds, a global neurological database, they should have become a type 2 civilization by the time we got to Pandora, but they're too freaking lazy. Frick them, they can die. Avatar, the movie where a crippled human betrays his race for a local girl and escapes all the repercussions for it. Furthermore, not only does he get away with it, he's rewarded for his treason with a new body and acceptance into an alien culture. Proof that if you believe hard enough and betray everything you and everyone around you has worked for, you'll be richly rewarded. Until the humans slam a quintillion kilogram asteroid traveling at 0.3c into the planet in order to mine the remnants in space. I don't think the narrator can agree with the assessment that the aliens are the bad guys just for living more or less in harmony with nature, or becoming, you know, a super-civilization that colonizes everyone else. You can't call them lazy when they live and die swinging through the trees and navigating perilous carnivores, whilst maintaining an egalitarian society that goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the industrial military might of Earth. That's a bad take, people. Imagine that you are from Cuba. You grew up shunned and ignored by the USA. In fact, the USA is a distant opponent that you don't know a lot about. You do know that they have a garrison on Cuba, and you know that they keep a military presence here that makes you uneasy. Let's just say that one day, soldiers from that garrison kill your only family members. You're so mad that you join a multinational freedom fighter force that plots to destroy the USA. Just after you join, escaping their military and fleeing your country, you learn that the USA has invaded and effectively destroyed the government of the nation you were headed towards, Panama. You are outraged and vow revenge. Through a series of misadventures, you find your boat taken captive on board an aircraft carrier, the Nimitz, from the USA. You manage to escape, liberating a political prisoner, but your best friend dies in the process. Not only do you hate the USA, you hate the symbol of American oppression, the Nimitz. You flee to Granada, but learn that the Nimitz is on the way, leading to a plan to topple that country as well. Desperately, you go out in speedboats to attach a bomb to the nuclear reactor. Almost all your fellow freedom fighters die in the attempt, but against all odds, you succeed. The bomb goes off and thousands die. You'll be hailed as a hero by your fellow freedom fighters, but in the USA, you'll be reviled as a villain of the worst sort and a murderer on a massive scale. They'll devote all of their resources to killing you and your peers. From their perspective, you are the bad guy. So what movie am I talking about? Star Wars. Cuba is Tatooine, the USA is the Empire, the Freedom Fighters are the Rebellion, Panama is Alderaan, Granada is a moon of Yavin, Nimitz is the Death Star. It's all about perspective. National Treasure. Nicolas Cage was the bad guy, and at worst, Sean Bean was misunderstood. Think back to the very beginning of the movie. Sean Bean and Nick Cage are both treasure hunting together. They've been a good team together. They've been working together well. 
Heck, Sean Bean has been funding the entire operation. Then they finally find the clue that tells them that the map is on the back of the Declaration of Independence. Sean Bean suggests that they borrow the map. Nicholas Cage suddenly and strangely says no. I'm not going to let you steal the Declaration of Independence. And essentially implies that he would stop Sean Bean from getting the declaration. Think about this for a minute. These two are friends. They've been working together for years. And suddenly, when they're so close, Nick Cage goes, Sorry, I'm not going to let you get the treasure. And then, to top it all off, Nick Cage steals the Declaration of Independence himself. He justifies it by saying that to stop Sean Bean from stealing the declaration, he, Cage, must steal it first. What? That's like if I was working in a bank robbery group and then decided that to prevent the bank robbery from happening, I should rob the bank first and keep the money for myself. It makes no sense and is a clear betrayal. Why didn't Cage just work with Sean Bean in the first place, and the two could have shared the treasure together like they'd planned? Finally, at the end of the movie, Nick Cage basically frames Sean Bean for the theft of the declaration. Remember, Nick Cage stole the declaration. The FBI agent specifically said that someone has to go to jail. Nick was caught and is on film with the Declaration of Independence. How did he not go to jail? Instead, Sean Bean goes, for doing what? He never stole the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, he might have done some other stuff like kidnapping, violence, etc. But those were justified because he had been betrayed by Cage. And there are lots of other little details throughout the movie showing Nick Cage's trickery and deception against Sean Bean. From the very beginning, it's made out like he used Sean Bean and his vast resources just to find the clue in that boat. And even when Sean Bean broke Nick Cage out of police custody, remember, Sean Bean was helping Nick Cage out here, Nick Cage was still pulling little tricks, hiding the truth, and not telling Sean Bean everything he knew, which they had made an agreement to do. Seriously, rewatch this movie, look at it very closely, and tell me how Sean Bean is the bad guy here. The entire movie, Nick Cage is pulling the tricks, hiding the ball, and betraying Sean Bean, who was his friend at the beginning of the movie. And just answer this very simple question. Nicolas Cage stole the Declaration of Independence. So why didn't he go to jail? In short, Sean Bean wasn't the bad guy in National Treasure, and Nick Cage was because he betrayed Sean Bean at the very beginning of the movie and essentially framed him as stealing the Declaration of Independence. Did you forget how the movie begins with betrayal and Sean trying to kill Nick? Or how Nick tries to go to the authorities first to warn them that someone will try to steal the Declaration, but they all ignore him due to his family's history? Or how, at the end, Sean leaves Nick and the crew in a pit, seemingly to starve to death? You're kind of reaching here, my friend. Ferris Bueller's day off. He skipped school, convinced his girlfriend to skip school, dragged his sick friend out of bed, and made his friend steal his father's incredibly expensive car. Ed Rooney was a hardworking educator. Most faculty in his position would have sighed, rolled their eyes, and shrugged Ferris's chronic absenteeism off. But Dean Rooney went above and beyond the call of duty, actually going out to track Ferris down and get his life back on track. And I know the actor who played Rooney was an awful man, you can all stop mentioning it. And I know that the character made it personal and crossed a bunch of lines, but that doesn't change the fact that A, he was doing his job, and B, Ferris was a self-entitled jerk and breaking the law left and right. Yeah, I think that everyone in the audience was well aware that Bueller isn't meant to be a saint. He's just a little craphead who's looking for a good time and takes us along with him. But I guess me pointing it out doesn't make it contrary to the point of this video. However, it does make me laugh thinking about people coming out of this movie white-fisted with rage about how awful this boy was for playing hooky from school. It always bothered me about how Rose, upon surviving the Titanic, went and got married and lived a happy life. The whole shebang. Once she dies, however, is when crap hits the fan. Does she go see her loving husband who spent his life with her? No, she goes with a dude she had a little fling on a boat with. Crap pisses me right off. Justin Bieber, Never Say Never 500 Days of Summer Tom I'm not sure that Summer could be the good guy or Tom could be the bad guy, just that they're guys. I think that's what the movie does so well. It paints them off as complex people living in shades of grey. Tom does idealise her, but I don't think that makes him bad. I think everyone has idealised a significant other or a crush at some point, and Summer told him that she wasn't looking for something serious, so I can't blame her for that. And yet, they were a couple, and she refused to acknowledge that fact. Bottom line is that both are exceedingly well-written characters. 
The all-time D-bag good guy in a movie was Santa Claus in the classic stop-motion Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. What a narcissistic, self-serving, poor sign SOB. He has zero empathy for anyone else's problems and has the gall to tell Rudolph's dad that his son had better outgrow the red nose if he wants to be on the sleigh team someday. It's pretty ironic that a human manatee in a red suit is ostracizing someone else based off their appearance. By the way, I'm a big boy, so I've got a bit of slack when it comes to the fat jokes. Rudolph's dad is no hero either. Frickin' suck up. His reindeer lips are locked firmly around old Kris Kringle's candy cane. He's totally on board in shaming his son for daring to look different. And let's not forget how he treated the elves after they spent so much time and energy groveling before him, celebrating his bowl full of jelly butt by singing his praises. It was very clear that Santa gave exactly zero fricks about the elves and their hosannas. I guess every slave owner has the same opinion. It's too bad they made the man in red look like such a squirming bag of Johnsons really casts a pall on my Christmas memories, considering how much I cherished that show when I grew up. Didn't really figure out how messed up it was until I hadn't seen it in years and watched it as an adult. In short, Santa is a jiggling bag of crap who treats Rudolph and the elves like they were toenail dirt. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories, or if you want some vibey music to put on in the background, check out Easy Mode. If you like Am I the Genius, give Am I the Jerk a shot. Everything linked in the description.